too. Hi, Mel. Good to see you, too. Yeah, so uh, just wanting to help students get to know you a little bit. Um, I'm a journalist with Lifelines, the student paper here, and so um, just create a conversation about who you are and what you do and all of that part of thing. So. Um, let's, let's jump into it. I'm all ready. Right. Perfect. So um, uh, the first question I have for you is uh, about the innovations and contributions that you've made to the field of chiropractic. And uh, how long have you been? You've been a chiropractor for 30 years, maybe? 40 years? <laughs> 36. 36, okay. I'm, I'm in my 36 year of practice. Okay. Yeah. And um, before, you know, before you started here at Life West, uh, I'd heard a lot about you. And so I just wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about your background and, and the different things you've done uh, in chiropractic so far. Okay, good, good. Well, first of all, I graduated in 1981. Okay. And then I started practice in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Nice. And I was there for about three, four years, three and a half years, four years. And then I sold my, I had a very successful office. I sold it to my associate doctor. I was just tired of the winters. I came from Michigan. I'm from Michigan originally. Okay. And I'm used to the snow. And I went to Boston. And I had the, I loved it there, but it was just, I've, 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 I've got to get the sun. So I wasn't going to go to Florida because that's where everybody in Michigan goes. Yeah. And uh, I ended up out in California. It was the only place to go. So I went to, I flew into L.A., traveled the coast, I checked every nook and cranny and decided on San Diego. Okay. And so we started practice there. So I've been there ever since. Like ever since, except okay. I took a year off. Okay. So once we found, you know, we knew where we were going to go and what was happening. Not, not Didn't know the, the location as far as the building location, but I sold my practice and then I, uh, I took a year off and traveled around the world. BJ went around the world. Yeah. Right. So I traveled around the world and I just uh, packed a bag and I bought a one way ticket in those days. It was on TWA. You, you might be too young that that airline wasn't I've even heard like, of that airline. good. All yeah. right. So, so TWA and their affiliates, Qantas and other airlines. And I started, I came out here to California and dropped my stuff off. And then I left and, you know, went to Australia, went to Hawaii, Australia. And then I went up to Asia and I just worked my way across. And the ticket, you can only go in one direction. Okay. So whatever direction you start in, you have to keep going in that direction. Right. But you can go anywhere you want. Yeah. So that's what I did. And, and did you do mo mainly chiropractic during that trip? No, I mean, I adjusted people, but okay. but, but I was al I traveled alone. Okay. I, I met some friends in different places. Yeah. There was no internet back then. Oh. So, uh, so one of my buddies in Boston, he, who I grew up with, um, he just graduated law school. And, and he, he came home one day. He stayed at my house because he had two weeks and his, rent, his lease was up. So he stayed at my place. And he saw my ticket on my table. He said, where are you going? I told him. He said, oh, my God, I'm, going, I'm traveling also. And we ended up meeting in India, of all places. And that was like four months later. And our plan was, if I'm not going to be there, because I might not have been there, and if he was, he was going to meet me at Delhi Airport. Uh -huh. And if he wasn't there, then we'd call his mother to see where each other were and Smart. whether it was on, because we couldn't communicate. Yeah, it wasn't, awesome. just couldn't go on WhatsApp, you know, and do that. And, uh, and he was there when I landed. I, I got there on that day and he was there. And so that kind of stuff happened, you know, yeah. but, but yeah, but, and I adjusted people along the way. I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I just, you know, adjusted people and I, and I learned a lot and I traveled and I just had a really good time and, you know, it was great. And came back, came to Cal, right to California and started up. Yeah. Started a practice. And so is that, have you created any additional practices or what's kind of been your uh, focus within chiropractic and within your own practice down there in San Diego? You know what happened, so I got to San Diego and I'd already practiced before and, and, uh, and I had a, a buddy of mine from Seattle who wanted to do the same thing. So he came down and we built this clinic together. We, we built up this clinic, two practices, separate practices in one facility with one reception room, you know, staff, we shared all that stuff. It was great. Smart. And we just, you know, we just knocked it out of the park. We did practicing before, so um, he'd been practicing the same amount of time as I. So we were probably seeing five, 600 patient visits a week at, awesome. at five months and went up to over 1,000, 1,200 visits a week and probably about a year, you know, a year and a quarter, something like that. And um, that's how I met my wife. My wife became our first associate. Right. And, uh, you know, she did a screening for us and she was just doing temporary work for us and she did a screening one day. She was actually leaving. This is a really interesting story. You, so yeah, you yeah, want stories? Please. Yeah, please. So my wife got into chiropractic because she, her her boyfriend in high school was Joe Dispenza. Oh wow! Yeah, that's yeah, cool. Joe's yeah. great. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. So so Joe was living in San Diego. So she so she got in. She was playing volleyball at University of North Carolina. Went down to visit him at life, just platonically, they're just friends, yeah. and and um and learned about chiropractic and just. It blew her mind. She sat in on a, on a like you have Friday assembly. Yeah. She sat in on a Thursday assembly with Dr. Sid Williams, 
And she left there, she left there so excited that she went back up, you know, she went back to North Carolina and there was actually a call from her athletic director when she got there. And so she said, that's weird, I didn't do anything wrong and I've been, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I'm, it's not during season right now, yeah. everything's okay. And, but here's the thing, she, w she walked on the team. She was like an all-American volleyball player in high school and stuff, and she played in New Jersey, that's where she's from. She had to get out of New Jersey, so she just literally went down to a college in North Carolina where her friend was playing baseball, softball. She walked on the volleyball team, and, and of course, and she, so, and she was like the star of the team. So she goes over to the athletic director, and he, see, and he says, Mary, he said, you played this whole year, you're our superstar of the team, and, you know, I want I, you walked on, we want to offer you a full ride to the University of North Carolina. And she looked him in the eye and said, I can't take it. Wow, she turned him down. Yeah. She goes, people are dying of vertebral subluxation and I've got to become a chiropractor to help. It. That's what she did. And he thought she was nuts. He thought she was on drugs and <laughs> he wanted to call her parents, you know, because nobody turns on it. And, and you know, she was, she was studying lab technician in science classes. She went right down to life and, uh, and went to school. And so that's how, we're, so she came and visited Joe Joe was in a bad accident, and I was taking care of him at the time. A bunch of us were taking care of him, but I was, I was, it was my day to be with him, right, to adjust him. Right. And, yeah, and, and she came in, and we met. We walked, took a walk on the beach. Just nothing, friends, you know, kind of thing. And then she moved to San Diego, and she, she was looking for work, and we hired her. We just opened our office up. We hired her, and we did a screening one day, and we brought in 125. It was a weekend. We brought in 125 new patients wow. from it. So she helped us process new patients, and like three weeks later, we said we need somebody, you know. So, so you know, we're probably about five hundred visits a week. So she, you know, she, she started, yeah. And then after that was history. So oh, beautiful. Mary. And and not only your wife, but you. I mean, it seems like a lot of your family is also involved in chiropractic. Yes, yeah, so I got two brothers that are chiropractors. There's three boys in our family. Okay. My two brothers are, are chiropractors. I'm, I'm the baby, and I was the first chiropractor. The second one was the second. My oldest was the third. Oh, funny. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's how it worked. It's reversed. Um, my two, I have three daughters, and two of them are chiropractors, and one of them is in tenth quarter here at school. Um, yeah, so so we're building a little. And then my oldest daughter, who's a chiropractor, is married to a chiropractor. She's about to have a baby in May, and I think probably a little chiropractor. And my second daughter, Morgan, who went to school here, she's living with a with the guy Daryl, who's and they have a practice together, and he's a chiropractor. Right, he teaches here. He right? teaches her too. And yeah. then my third daughter, Sydney, was a was a volleyball player at uh, Montana State University, and she started dating the guy for a couple of years there on the basketball team. And he was a he was a PT major. She brought him home one summer for a vacation, and we drove up to, to UCLA to see my other daughter. And he sat in the front seat with me. And by the time he got home, he said to her that night. I gotta look at what chiropractic's really about. Good, good. He's in school with her now, and they came to school together, so they're together. So, so cool. that's what you do. Yeah. But she asked me about the things I've done in chiropractic. So I practiced, of course, and then after practice, I was in practice in 19, I wanna say it was 1987, maybe. Dr. Sid Williams called me and, and said, uh, in his deep southern voice, boy, I need you up in the board at Life West, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I said, didn't know anything about governance, didn't know anything about boards, but, you know, he said, I need you up there to be working with Jerry and helping the school. So I came up and I was on the board and I, and I just recently went off to take the interim position. Yeah. And then I got involved in state politics. I was in the, I was the ICA rep for the state of California. Okay. And then I got involved in state politics and, you know, and then um, international politics. And I became the vice president of the ICA at one point and, um, yeah, so I've done. I've been working with the school for probably 28 years, wow. something like that, and uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a ride. And I've been I've been lectured all over. I had a, I, a, I was uh, teaching chiropractors for many years, coaching chiropractors and putting seminars on and stuff like that for probably about 16 or 18 years. Okay. And yeah, yeah. Started a, a buying group for chiropractors. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. So so uh, it's doctors it's called Doctors Purchasing Group and and. Uh, so I've done a lot of things in chiropractic, right? You know, yeah. and I've, I've, I've taught, I used to teach the, you know, I don't know if you knew, when, when uh, Guy Reekman was president at, at Palmer mm -hmm. in Davenport, Iowa, he had Fred Barge come and work for him, and Fred started the, 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 the um, philosophy program back up, meaning the, the um, what's it called, the uh, doctor philosophy, right? Oh, right. Like the okay. PHC program, you yeah. know, what BJ had and all the Stevenson and those guys. But, but what he did was, it was called a different name. They, could, they didn't use it. But so you go through one year, and you get your first, you get your first level of certificate, and then you had to go two more years. Okay. So they had me teaching that for them. So I was teaching over there with Fred and doing stuff. So wow. yeah, it's just cool stuff. And yeah. uh, you know, the, the characters that I kind of hung out with. I was over at BJ's house um, in Sarasota, Florida. Uh -huh. I was at a I was at a DE seminar in uh, 
in Naples, and me and a buddy of mine who I went to school with, we drove up to Sarasota, and we got the house for the day, for the night, and so we slept in the house. I'm in BJ's bed. You know, I slept in BJ's so bed because I because I paid the money for the place. So I, <laughs> and my buddy was next BJ's to me. Bed. My buddy was next to me in Mabel's bed. You know, it was <laughs> funny. And so I'm in BJ's bed. But meanwhile, we're, that before that happened, we're we're hanging out that night. We're just in the we're in the zebra room. It's a library in the house, and and all the green books. I mean, it's just it's just it's exactly how BJ probably had it. And uh, and I hear this this voice from the outside. It says it's in Florida. It's a kind of like a summer spring night. It was really nice, right on the water, crickets, and it was really cool. And all of a sudden, I hear Oberstein, I'll be damned. And it walks in. It's Fred Barnes. And Fred walks in because no Sid Williams had the house right next door. Oh wow! And Fred was writing one of his books. I think he was writing Giant versus Pygmy at the time. And so he would go over to Dr. Williams' house and and you know just spend weeks or months. You know, writing his books and stuff like that. Yeah. So he comes over. He's got, a, you know, I don't know, a case of beer under his arm, and we drank, we drank beer and told stories till about three, four in the morning. Oh, and beautiful. yeah, it was great. It was great. And oh. Fred was a great guy. Fred, I have a, I have a letter from Dr. Barge, from Fred Barge, um, that he wrote me. It's framed somewhere. I somewhere. I don't. I got boxes of these things, and uh, because. Jerry Clum, who was the first president here for right, 30 I years. Him as well, yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Well, Jerry had some knee replacements. He has, every part of his body is bionic these days, but he had knee replacements. So Fred came out and sat in as interim president for six for oh, six okay. months. I've never heard that. Yeah, six months. And okay. he said it was, and he had a thing saying, it could, he, he just told me, he wrote this thing saying, thank you so much, and because I was on the board. He said, you know, he had the, it was the best six months of his life, he said. Cool. He absolutely loved it. Yeah. These are the characters in chiropractic, not characters by negatively. Legacies. Legacies in chiropractic, yeah. yeah who yeah. are just, if you go to the library and see these tapes, you'll, it'll just blow you away. I can tell you a story. Have you ever heard the name Ian Grassum? I have not, no. Ian practiced in Michigan. He moved to Florida. He's passed away since then. But he was one of the seven people who walked with Dr. Williams on the beach in the Plan for Life College. Cool. Right? So Ian was, a, was just a phenomenal chiropractor, a visionary, just a, a most eloquent chiropractic speaker I've ever seen. I mean... There's a, there's a video of him in the library, go see it, where he takes on Stephen Barrett. You've heard that name? Mm -hmm. He's a medical doctor who started the quackery. I have heard of that name. Good, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they did this in Detroit, and he debated him on TV. Barrett didn't know this, but everyone in the crowd was either a chiropractor, chiropractic spouse, or patient. Oh, wow. It was set up, but when you watch this, it was just, they just ripped, Ian just eloquently ripped him apart. And, it was just unbelievable. So make sure you go see that. So me and Ian, Gra I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in Orlando, Florida. I'm going to have some kind of program. I don't know. And I, I end up leaving it. And, I, and I'm just, I just went out for the night. I just went to a restaurant and went somewhere. With it, and I ran into Ian. I go, oh, my God. We ran into each other. Ron, what are you doing? I go, I'm just hanging out. I got a few days. He said, well, come with me. So we go and we hang out. He takes me. And it's about 10 o'clock at night. We drive to this motel or hotel. You know, and we walk in. And in the room is um, Dan Murphy. Michael Schmidt, I don't know if you know Michael Schmidt, he used to be the dean of the college here. Okay. He's Dr. Clum's brother-in-law. Okay. Um, Dan Pagrellis, Dan used to be an instructor here. If you ever see the hands on the wall, those are Dan's. Oh, those are Dan's. Yeah, yeah, those are Dan's. Dan passed away. He died of AIDS, but, he, but that was many years ago. Okay. And maybe one other person, and they were literally there for CCE to get their recognized candidacy. That was before you get fully accredited. Mm -hmm. And they had to be tested. They, had to, you know, they were going to be questioned. And so Ian and I went in there, and we, and we just took the books, and we, they had papers. We just asked them. We, just, we were just firing questions at yeah. them left and right, left and right, acting yeah. like we were CCE, you know, kind of thing. And you know, these are the kind of fun things that kind of pop up when you just innately live your life. And out of anywhere, Orlando, Florida, I run into Ian, and these guys are at a hotel. And so that, I can tell you a million stories like that. Yeah, but, I can but tell. But just what they are. Huh. So my legacy, I don't know. You know, I don't, I, the things that I've done politically and the things that I've done you know, my practice and in my state and, and, and in my city. You know, we, my wife and I and my, my ex-partner too, we brought on people every year, an associate doctor every year for about 13 years or wow. so. Only, only stay one year. Okay. That's it. One year. And we kick you out after a year. You have to replace yourself. Okay. And you got to go start a practice. That's awesome. Yeah. So out of those 13, whatever it was, uh, one of them left the state. And uh, one of them got married, moved moved away, different area. And there's 11 practices now in San Diego that breeded from our practice because there were no principal practices when we got to San Diego. Oh, really? There were, but I didn't know where they were, and there yeah. wasn't. Nobody was was really just you know Im imbibing the, the the give, love, serve, and the lasting purpose, and the you know, and really just kind of doing that. So, 
So we decided we just got to spawn our own. So you'd come in, and we'd, pr and we'd teach you. You know, you'd, you'd have a Thursday afternoon alone. You'd see 200 people, and you know, by yourself. We wouldn't. We when you got to that point, right? And we, we wouldn't even come in. You just see people, and then yeah. boom. And uh, and by the time you got out, you were just ready to ready to rock and roll after a year, and you just go out and do your stuff. And that's how we figured we create our own community, right? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, you've you've contributed so much and created so much. And I know, you know, you said you started with the board in 1987. Something like that. Um, yeah, uh, so in terms of the board, like. How does the board interface with Life Chiropractic College? I, I feel like um, as a student, I don't really understand that relationship and how that, that works. Because maybe you could lay it yeah, out. I will. I will. And, and to be honest with you, know, most people don't understand it. And, and our board understands it. But there are, there are boards, of boards, other boards, they don't understand it either. Right. So, so one of the big things is board governance. Okay. And, you, and you bring in governance experts to teach a board how to, how to run effectively and smoothly and there's always different issues that the, the college is like a ship it could be going nice and smooth for a while and it might hit some rough weather like we've had before yeah. right you know that kind of and then and boards have to some boards they react differently but I'll tell you the makeup of a board and what happens so boards have a chair I have a chair of a board I was just recently the chair of our board and um, the board of this college how long were you the chair for I was a chair for maybe a year and a half oh, some of that okay yeah yeah a year and a half and then I then when I stepped into the interim position, yeah. I had to jump off the board. Right. So that's what I chose to do. Jimmy Jim, so chair. Jimmy okay. so Jimmy stepped up and you know and, and there was a bunch of people who were willing to do it, but Jimmy was a, worked out to be the most logical choice just by time, you know, having free time. It's a it's a it's like a full time job at some sometimes during the time. Okay. So and because you know, all the things when you look at the when you look at a college, you know, you've got your you got your president. Right. Your president is the CEO of the company. Quote unquote, right. and your president has a boss, and the boss is the board. Got it. So the board has one employee. Yeah. That's the president. Okay. Got it. And then the president has everyone else under him, okay. right, or her. So that's how it works. It goes like that. Yeah. So the board is set up to govern. Well, what's governance? Governance is setting policy. Governance is setting direction. Mm -hmm. You know, the vision of where they want the college to go, right? That's what the board, the board doesn't do administrative stuff. Okay. They don't do hand day-to-day -day issues of the college. They don't, you know, some boards do in, in places and that's not healthy. Yeah. Because when a board starts running the college on a day-to-day -day level, why do they have, Too many cooks why, do they ha why do they have their CEO? Yeah. You know, so you can't disempower your CEO, right? Yeah. Now, if there's an emergency situation that happens, and you have a good board, they're going to jump in, yeah. right? You know, but it's just a temporary kind of thing. Would, it, would an analogy be, you know, we're like in Silicon Valley, so would an analogy be kind of like a venture capital firm that invests money into a CEO of a startup kind of thing? Like the venture capital is really, because they're investing the money, is really making a lot of the decisions, but they're letting the... CEO kind of run the business. I, I, I don't know much about venture capital. Okay. I've, I've never had a business with a venture capital. But if that's the case, yeah, the venture capitalists don't don't necessarily go over to the company and start running the company. Right. Right. It just doesn't happen. It's the same thing with donors. Yeah. When you have donors, if you go to Stanford and there's a donor who gives ten million dollars, because they gave ten million dollars, some donors really want to have their fingers in everything. Right. Yeah. It's not healthy. It doesn't it doesn't work. It's not healthy. And I know I just recently uh, talked to someone who at their college, and this is a college on the East Coast, not chiropractic, and they turned away a $20 million donation. Because of that. Because the, they, the people wanted to. So then there's other donors who just give, and that's it. They might have contingencies around their giving, meaning I only want this to go toward the chiropractic college or right. toward, the, toward the science or toward the... The, the, the journalistic school, right. whatever they the want to do. Chair endowment that we yeah, exactly. So okay. same thing. So we got a so we have a six hundred thousand dollar you know endowment that came and matching. We have to match it with, from other donors, which would be one point two million. So the people who did that, who started that endowment with the six hundred thousand, they don't dictate like who's going to be the philosophy chair and who's going to do. It's not their job. You know, they just donate the money. And, but they have contingencies. And their contingencies, I'll donate the money, but it's going to go into an endowment. It can't be spent. Yeah. So, and that's the contingency that they get. It's a contract that the school, the school signed a contract with them yeah. saying that. So, so, and the reason why it's a contract is because in 15 years, when anybody around here might not be here anymore, new people are here, they can't go, oh, well, there's that money sitting over there. We can just grab it. Yeah. Can't work. It doesn't work like that. Right. There's a contract. So they can't break that contract. And that's right? kind of what the board does then too, right? They create these contracts, they create this this governance so that you know you can go generation after generation with 
kind of a similar vision and a similar mission. Right, right. So the board works with the, works with the, the strategic plan of the college. Mm -hmm. And when you have a strategic plan, it could have seven points, eight points, ten points. This, this depends. That's your guide. That's your, that's your, that's your playbook. And that's what you're looking to do, and that's what you work toward, right? And your strategic plan has to be in line with your mission. Yeah. And so, you know, your mission statement. So, so that's how it works. And then the board just sets policy. The board meets like usually four times a year. And I was on a board call today. I was so we just went over the, you know, the last two quarters and what's happening at the college and if they have any questions and then they can report back. So this committee then will go and report back to the whole board. So, so it's not like they're blind and they don't know what's going on and all of a sudden the ship sinks and they, they're not. So they, they govern, but they don't get involved unless there's a major, major emergency yeah. or that kind and of stuff. And you were on that call as the interim president, not yes. as a board member. I was on as president, not as, as a CEO, yeah. not as a board member. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of that interface, it sounds like the board and the president are really the only people that interface. Like the board doesn't really interface with any of the other faculty or administrators. Right. And so most of the, so that it sounds like. Well, no, if they, they can interface, you know, they can, they can say hi, they might know them and be yeah. able to, but as far as directing them on what to do or how to do or any of that, that's, that's off limits for, for uh, a healthy board. A healthy functioning board. Okay. There's something called the weeds when you get too far in the weeds, right? And the weeds are where you you know you start trying to run the college and, and, and tell people what everything. to do and manage and stuff like that. And that's that's when you get into trouble. Because okay. like you said, there's too many cooks and you know, and you disempower your CEO and before you know it, you know, the board is running the school and, and they're the the board are volunteers, they're not being paid. Yeah. So, you know, they need to that's not what their their purpose is, you know. Their purpose right. is to make sure they put the right person in place have the policies around it, set up the policy. It's like a football field, right? The policies are the boundaries, yeah. right? And you know you want to go here and score a touchdown. They get the right team and the right quarterback or right, right coach to get the right team to move it, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. But the board doesn't come on the field and play. Right. But, the, but, if, but if the team goes outside the boundaries, there's a penalty. Yeah. Because those are the policies that the board sets up, right? right? You know, and that's, so the board is kind of like the... Head coach, the offensive coordinator, the defensive the coordinator. The board is like the owner. Yeah. It's oh, okay. more like the owner, it's not the head coach. Okay. They're like the owner and they set the policies up, yeah. right? And then the head coach then the, the head coach or the you know, CEO. Exactly. Yeah. Or maybe the general manager could be yeah. the CEO and then he's got head coaches and the coach of the defensive line and this kind of stuff. And then but he knows what the boundaries are, cannot go outside the boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a good analogy. Yeah. So it's really cool. And 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 it works very well because what it does is it puts people responsible. For the for the running of the ship, like the captain of the ship can run it, he's got his crew, but you got people in other places that are making, you know, just just they're watching it to make sure it's going where it's supposed to be going. Because you could be at sea and all of a sudden turn this way and right. you, and you get off course, right? Yeah. So it's it, you usually get in that tunnel vision to some extent. That's, what that's how it helps you but, do your job. But what keeps the captain moving in the right direction is a strategic plan. Yeah. Because that's our plan that we have. Right. And then we have our boundaries that I can't go into these waters here because that's you know, Chinese water, and I can't go over here because that's something else. So I know the lanes that I can stay in, right? Yeah. And that's how you that's how you operate. That's how you function healthy. Yeah. Right. And so it seems like most of the information then flows from the board to the president, as it, and then the president kind of reports back to the board about yes. how those strategic decisions are being implemented. Right. But but yeah, exactly. But remember this: it the board sets the strategic plan with the president and right. with key, key administrators from the schools. Not just, okay. they just don't sit on, so they work with it, except, and then once it's set, it's, it's, it's done. Okay. Now they just monitor, right. right? So there's a strategic plan of how are we doing financially, what are we doing with growth, what are we doing with facilities, you know, whatever the strategic plan might, might encompass. And those are, usually, some of those aren't even in, like, facilities might not be in it unless you're looking to move toward a new school or redo something, whatever it is, right. and they want to know what's in it. You know, and, and then, then you give them reports back, and that's why we have, the board has committees. So they have an academic affairs committee, mm -hmm. right, that meets with our academic people, right? Not to tell them what to do, just to hear this is what's going on, this is what's been happening, you know, this is kind of stuff. So they report back up to them, right? Mm -hmm. I'll be on, the, I'm, on I'm on every call because okay. I'm, I'm the CEO. Yeah, right. but, I don't, but, I don't, but I'm not involved with academic, I don't have, I'm not intimately involved with academic right. affairs. That's not, not in the weeds. That's Dr. Donaldson, yeah. right? Because that's yeah. his job, right? And he reports to me, and then when, and then I don't need to take his information. He reports to the board with me, right? 
I got him and I've got institutional advancement, that's Dr. Ziegler, yeah. and I've got, you know, the health center and I've got, you know, all these different pieces. I got the offense, defense, special teams, you know, um, you know, anything else that's, that, that's around there. There's so much happening. And so those are the people that I put there that, that I feel are going to do a phenomenal job and I let them, I got to let them do their thing too. Right. right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just kind of orchestrate all that and create that interface between That's right. between both sides. So I'm in, so, lot, so I'm in lots of meetings. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> it sounds like you're like, amazing meetings. And how long have you been interim president now? Has it been... Since uh, I, I got here October 31st. October 31st. Okay. And how's it going? You enjoying... Yeah, yeah, you got me on a good day. You got me on a good day. <laughs> I'm good. No, I am. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a lot. No, and, and, you know, I mean, there are days, I won't kid you, that, you know, I get in my car to, you know, to, to leave here, and, and I go to the right when I leave here, and the airport's to the left, and I just say, <laughs> what am I doing? Just go to Oakland the Airport and go home. I mean, I, this is my first full-time job that I've ever had. Oh, know, really? Since, I, since being a chiropractor, right? Yeah. You know, where I'm actually, you know... Yeah, be here every yeah day. let me let me tell you the life of a chiropractor is you're gonna have a very uh, nice life, <laughs> very nice life, and I and I you know and I you know, and I love this. It's you know the, the thing that I love about this. I'm you know I'm I'm a natural kind of, I've I've got a bunch of other companies and stuff like that, so I know how to how to lead and how to run people and you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest thing I think the biggest love that I get at the end of the day, it's knowing that we're shaping and making an experience for people like yourself. To be able to go out and be successful, yeah. and and I won't I won't say I've made a big dent like that in, in five months or however long I've been here four months right mm -hmm. November December January so three and a half months whatever you know yeah. three three quarters but it's something that I you know that that we've made some we've inputted changes and we're and we're cleaning things up and 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 really kind of reinstilling um, uh, philosophy and things back into the college and. Just seeing the, the, the vibration change from the administration and the staff and the faculty, that's going to bleed down into, you know, into the students, right? Yeah. And, um, and my whole thing is I want every woman, man, and child on the planet to have access to chiropractic care. That's my goal. My, that's my mission in, my, in life as far as my professional mission, right? It's also my mission anyways because uh, my whole family is part of that, right? Yeah, right. You know? So, so you know, we've always lived our life, you know, God, family, chiropractic, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's how we live our life. But my family is in chiropractic, and I'm in chiropractic, so we're all here, and we know God is part of chiropractic, so it's kind of one big circle yeah, instead right. of it's three separate ones. So, right? yeah, so, so knowing that, that, that that's my mission of what, what I want to do in my personal life, you know, I, I can reach more people by students, you know, and... And so, and we've always, my wife and I have always said that back in the 80s, we were flying on Southwest Airlines and sometimes uh, PSA, you know, that was, uh, um, I don't even know what it stands for, but Pacific something airlines, yeah, or, yeah, it was like, it was like an airline that got eaten up, there was a bunch of them. We would fly like 50 students at a time, prospective students at a time up to the college. Oh, no way. You know Champions? Yeah. It wasn't like Champions, but it was like one day. Similar They'd come up, idea. come yeah. up, the school would pick us up, we'd leave at 6.30 in the morning from San Diego, We'd be here, you know, by 8:30 on campus. They'd have breakfast for the for the students, perspectives. They they'd see admissions and they'd see all these different people. They'd sit in classes. They'd have lunch with students, oh, cool. and I take by we're by 3:30, 4 o'clock. We're back in a, back in the buses, going back to the airport, right? Yeah. Because we knew that we needed more chiropractors if we really wanted to touch more people. Yeah. So that's what we did, and we just started trying to bring as many people up to Life West as we can to see if chiropractic was the right thing for him, right? Yeah. I think to date. I think to date they stopped counting. Like we're over 300 uh, uh, students that we've sent to to Life West, wow, and that's, that's but that's but that's that's not like the bus loads of people because the plane loads of people because some of those were other chiropractors patients that that came to a came to a student night in my office, uh -huh. and then my wife and I just offered the flight. We 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 paid for all those flights, Amazing. you know, because we just wanted to expose people more to chiropractic, right? Yeah. So some of those I'm not counting. There's more the direct referrals that we have, but. It's like the biggest thing. So now here I am. So just the accumulation of it, the yeah. culmination. Now here I am watching that happen. Yeah. You know. So be actually sitting, sitting, sitting in the kitchen instead of just sending the food up, right? right? You know, and visiting every once in a while. I'm like sitting in the kitchen cooking. You know. Yeah. So it's kind of like full circle. It's it's really interesting, and there's nothing better than putting out great chiropractors and having people go out and you know save the world. Yeah. So and feel free. You don't have to answer anything that I ask you, but. 
Like, how is this affecting your family? Are you able to get back to San Diego and see your wife? Or yeah. do you have any uh, plans of staying on long term? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. As far as my wife, um, you know, we're both we're both in this thing. You know, like like when what happened was, you know, there, the, it kind of opened up, and we needed to have some of these seats. There was a yeah. there was a lot going on with Wask and with this and all this. Right. Stuff. So I was chair of the board, and, and it's really common for a chair to jump into. You know, uh, uh, an empty presidency seat. And yeah. The reason uh, was there a specific process for how that took place, or did the board just kind of ask yeah. you? The process was on a Thursday night. I got a phone call. <laughs> we were supposed to have a board meeting. I called on the so I, we called on the board meeting, yeah. and they had separate meetings that I didn't know about. Uh, yeah. And they said, "We think we found an interim." I said, "Oh yeah, who's that?" And they said, "You." And I went, <laughs> "Really?" <laughs> I, that's how it happened. But um, but it's real common because because. You know, with with uh, with Dr. Kelly, the previous president, being the board chair, I was pretty intimate. Like we were on the phone all the time, so I was really intimate on what was going on with, with our employee, right? So you know, that, and usually on a board, the president doesn't speak to all the board members. The president speaks to the chair. Got it. Okay. Because otherwise, it could be too political, right? Yeah. Right. So the president speaks to the chair, yeah. and then the chair then reports to the board, and the chair speaks to the president. So okay. you know. So the or other board members don't usually call the president and say, hey, what's going on? What's happening in this thing? Unless they're involved in something with them. Maybe they're doing a project in Pennsylvania and, and they have to work together on this, right? That's a right. different kind of a thing. So, so, um, so since I was intimately knowing what was happening, yeah, it's, it it's, it's the easiest transition. It really is. So, so that's, that's how it took place. And, and my wife just said, it, it need, we need to do this. You know, it's not me, it's we. You know, and we need to do this. You know? so, so it's been fine. Um, I go down to San Diego, um, not every weekend, but pretty much we see each other almost every weekend. This is, in fact, this is the first weekend, except when I'm out of town, if I'm out of the country or traveling or whatever. Right. This is the first weekend coming up, starting this weekend, that, I, that we won't see each other oh. for not being for out of town. Okay. I'm just, it just, I don't even know why. I just, we just didn't book flights, whatever, so, and I just moved into a place, so I'm just going to kind of hang out and relax and, and kind of, you know, not travel for a weekend. And, yeah, it'd be good. And yeah. she's coming up the following weekend, the long weekend that we have. Oh, nice. She'll be up, and you know. But what the interesting thing about it, Noel, is that I've got two daughters that are up here. Uh -huh. So and so one one daughter that's here, in my practice right? down yeah. there. So it's like I, I got more family that you know I, you know I'm seeing yeah. more of my kids than she is, you know. <laughs> but great. it's great. And we talk every night. We talk during the day, and okay. you know it's great. Okay. And so, do you have any like timeline? And do you uh, does the board have any idea on how long it's going to take to hire a new president? Uh, they're working on it. I mean, okay. I mean, he, he, normally what happens, and I, I, you have to know this. I'm not involved in this process at all because yeah, that would be conflict of interest. Yeah, I'm just not involved in yeah. it. So, so the the statistical average of of a of a of bringing in a new president is usually six to eight months. Yeah, makes sense. It's, it's it's time you got to find the right person. exactly. And the and the issue and the other the other challenge that happened was. Um, I stepped in on October 31st, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a very quick thing. Yeah. You had a couple of weeks and it was Thanksgiving. Right. And then Christmas. And then so not Christmas. much is happening during those time periods. Right. People are traveling and people are going, whatever. So they really kind of more hit the... We got things stable as far as me being here. And then they started really working on it in January. You know, that's probably more of a more of a, an accurate kind of assessment. You know, they were... Believe me, they were doing work as much as they could during the during the holiday season, but it's just difficult. People are with families, and they knew they knew everything was okay here, yeah. you know? So it wasn't like there was like this this uh, five alarm fire bell going off saying, you know, there's smoke, we gotta do something. It wasn't like that. But they also know that uh, that they that you know, they have to find somebody. So that's what they're doing, and they're, yeah. they're working on it. And, and I feel like things are more than okay here. Like, I, like kind of you alluded to this earlier, and I felt this as a student. Like, there's kind of like a tone change that seems like it's, taken place in the new year and I don't know exactly what it is maybe it's coming from administration or from faculty but just like the overall morale seems to be a little bit mm. different it's good to hear so what do you see I mean what how do you assess that um, I think I assess it by the uh, amount of complaining that I'm exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> so less complaining less complaining over yeah, that's a good yeah, indicator or, right? or more people willing to like look for the silver lining and try and see like why a certain policy is being implemented or try and see the bigger picture yeah. of what um, the college is trying to achieve with all the, the hoops that it seems like we're having to jump through. Yeah, and that's, and that's a great thing. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things when I got here was, you know, you, you, everybody needs a North Star, yeah. you know, and every company needs a North Star. Well, we have our, our, our vision statement, right, you know, right. of what we do, you know, create a brighter future. 
for humanity, but what is it that, that guides us, you know? And so what I, what I brought back, and so it was here, it was founded, and you know, we founded when Dr. Williams took over Life West, um, you know, took over Pacific States and made it Life West, yeah. he brought something called lasting purpose, yeah. right? So I've been working to, in, to instill that back into the college. It's always been here, but it hasn't been the main focal point. Right. And probably the reason why it wasn't with Dr. Kelly is because he, he didn't grow up in that. Yeah. He, was, he, he came from New Zealand and, and New Zealand Chiropractic College. He knows about it, but it wasn't part of who he was in his fabric, which was, which was fine, because he had to put his own stamp on it. There's no negative about that, right? Totally. Yeah, so, so I just needed, for me, for my North Star that I see that the college, it's, it's lasting purpose. It's to give the love, you know, give the do to love and serve, right? Yeah out of your own abundance without expecting anything in return. And that, that puts somebody in a very um, uh, uh, state of gratitude, you know, in a very uh, gracious place. And so, so when people work out of grace, your life just flows. And, you know, that's, that's living from the inside out, and that's what we're about, above, down, inside out. So lasting purpose is kind of that mirror. And then I, then I realized that we really need to have some, some, you know, a couple metrics here. And so we, we made it, you know, I came up with being student-centric, and mission centric. So everything we do around the college right now is student centric, mission centric. I like it. Right? How does it impact our students? How does it impact our mission? Yeah. And if we take care of those, we're going to be everything just fine. Just fine. Yeah. So, you know, that's just a, in practice, it's the same thing. You know, we always put our patients first. Our patients' needs came before ours. Yeah. I could be. I could have a blown out knee, a torn rotator, which I have right now. I could be and have the and 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 have the worst headache in the world, and you would never know it as a patient, and my staff would never know it, yeah. and my staff here doesn't know it, yeah. because I don't talk about because I'm here to take care of them. It's not about me. Right, and your cup is still full. Yeah, right? you can have these things going on physically, yeah, but you can still have a full cup. Well, the hole you give through, you know, the hole that I give through. Yeah is directly proportional to the whole that I receive through. So if I give more, I'm gonna receive this, you know, the same amount, you know, or, or, or maybe more. It's, it's what it is. So, so, so for, for me to be here and complain about my shoulder, complain about this, complain about that, da, 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 I'm not serving the students. I'm not serving the mission. I'm not serving anybody, you know, right? So it's not what happens. Now my wife can hear my drama, right? Yeah, right. And I can hear hers, <laughs> but because we all got it, right? You know, that kind of thing. But 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 uh, you know, but as far as as far as what I do here, you know, it's really about just service, and that's that's what I think that, that I know our administration's on that, and I know that our, our staff is is on that because we've been talking about lasting purpose, and and we've been bringing that in. I just had a meeting yesterday with the HR and business office, all about lasting purpose. I had an hour with them, and I'll be going back through all the other other folks and. It's just important, you know, that for them to really understand. A lot of them have been here for a long time, and they 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 went, oh my God, I love it because they so they're used to it, you know. Yeah. And others are just like, what? Wow, you know. Yeah. Oh wow, you know that kind of thing. So. So powerful. It's what happens, man. Yeah. You know, you get your you get your north star. You, you're not going to get lost if you know where you're going. Completely. Yeah. And speaking of lasting purpose, you know, and that coming from Sid Williams, and you've already mentioned, you know, so many legacies within the chiropractic profession, but. Um, are there any kind of historical figures that you really resonate with or anything historically in chiropractic that really has inspired you and motivated you? Yeah. Uh, Sid, uh, number one is Dr. Sid Williams. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up as a student, you know, listening to him, you know. So I would, when we'd have our, our your Friday seminar, we had it on Thursdays, I'd be in the front row just listening to him. Didn't understand half of what he said, but not verbally I understood it. But the concepts until they finally started seeking because they were they were so beyond their time, you know. You know, this was back in 1979, you know, 1980, 81, that kind of thing. And and the stuff he was talking about was just it was you know it was very very metaphysical on a certain level, right? And and but yet very very powerful and true. Yeah. And and so I grew up with you know just listening to him, you know. I, mean, I remember he would just I felt like I was the only one in the room, and he'd be talking to me. And there was, you know, 900 students or whatever there was there. It's just kind of how it was. And, and um, so Dr. Sid was, was a huge, a huge influence in my life. And he taught me how to give, do, love, and serve, you know. And I, there's nothing I, I can never, any success that I have in chiropractic, I owe to him. I mean, I, I really do because what I learned from him and it's just amazing. And then the other people along the road, um, 
when I was in school, we used to have a group called the, the Tuesday Lunch Club, the TLC, and it was me and two other chiropractors, right? One, Eric Valkyrie's in Australia, and then David Davis, who were all best buddies. He's in Connecticut. We, we all graduated around the same time, and, and um, David and I were in the same class, and we'd go for lunch every Tuesday at this place called Sons of Italy. It was a Italian joint, mm -hmm. and we would just eat, and we'd talk about clearing out the hospitals, and what are we going to do where we go practice, and, you know, we just, just vision, just people, you would have thought we were nuts. So one day... I, I, bef I, I just became friends with a guy named named uh, named uh, Stretch Weaver, Chappy Reaver. Mm -hmm. Chappy Reaver was uh, the son of Herbert Ross Reaver. Do you know? Ever heard that mm -hmm. name? Herbert Ross Reaver is the most jail chiropractor in the history of chiropractors. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you, you've heard. Him. So right. Chappy, he came to lunch with us one day, and he graduated in 19, same time as Sid. He graduated. He's, he had a practice in Marietta. He was practicing in another place. He practiced in Marietta. He was going to retire there, and he came to lunch with us, and he just started crying. He said, I haven't been around this kind of energy since my days of Palmer, right? That's what he said. That, that was like a, to us, it was like, whoa, you know, yeah. kind of deal. So anyway, so we became friends. And when I graduated, he gave me my very first original green book, oh, nice. Evolution or Revolution. That was the book he what gave me. Great. Just yeah. so beautiful. And he said this to me. I was leaving to go to Michigan. And, and I don't know where you're from, but for, from the top, yeah. okay, the top of Michigan, the very top, the Upper Peninsula, or right before the, there's a Highway 75, and it goes all the way down to Miami. So just one art, like I-5, yeah. San Diego, border San Diego, all the way to Vancouver, yeah. Vancouver, BC, right? You know, all the way to the border. So, so he said, would you do me a favor? I go, yeah. He goes, would you stop and see my father? I went, yeah, sure. So I went up and I stopped in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where Herbert Ross Reaver was. And I met him and I had dinner with him and his wife. And, you know, it was really funny and all. I, I waited for him. I'm in his, he works out of his house. He was 80-something years old, maybe 70, 75, I don't know. You know, he was, he was old, right? Okay. I mean, yeah. so old that we got in his car, and he, he, it was like a 19, felt like 1940 Packard. He had the, the hat on and the, and the, <laughs> and the overcoat. I thought I was like with the mafia. I don't yeah, know what, right. I was, what I was doing. And he goes, uh, I waited, uh, people in and out, in and out. And I'm sitting in the reception room, and they're going in and out, in and out, in and out. And then finally, I, you know, he, there's no one else. He, he comes out and says hello to me. And, uh, and then he takes me back, says, and then we'll get, he says, Jim's going to check me. And he looks at me and he says, uh, do you adjust with the shirt on or the shirt off? And he asked me how I adjust people. Yeah. I'm a student, just graduated like four days ago. I'm like, it's so green. I'm like, you know, but I thought I was the, the I was, I thought I was the shit, you know. Yeah, right. It was like, and so he goes, I hope I can say that on your tape. Yeah. And he goes, and he goes, uh, and he, so he looks at me. And I go, shirt on, and he goes, mixer. And he, oh. he walks around. I'm like, oh my god. I, I was like, so, so he adjusts me. I have probably the greatest adjustment I ever had. And then, uh, and then we go for dinner, and we became friends. We started talking all the time, writing to each other because there was no internet back then, you know, doing that stuff. And before I know it, you know, we just we're just like we're friends. You know, it's just so cool. You know, and I'm friends with his wife. His wife is Millie. Um, he wrote a book. She wrote a book about him or some people, and and we published it. Jerry Clum and I. Oh, nice. Well, not Jerry Clum and I. Jerry Clum and Life West. But I got the manuscript because we were very close. We yeah. brought him. We flew him out to a big convention that we had, and uh, in in Anaheim, and we had about a thousand people there, and. He would he had him up on stage. It was after our long day seminar, and we had him up on stage, him and his wife, and I just interviewed him. And we have a, there's a DVD here at school on it. And it was unbelievable, the stories he told about being in jail and all the things that happened. He was so humble and so, you know, he, he was trained. He was BJ's vice president when BJ was president of the ICA. Wow. And he was in prison at the time. And BJ would write to him. I read letters. It was just unbelievable. So he was just amazing. We, we, before he came in, we told the group there was going to be a legacy that if, if you'd like to, you, we're going to have a box at the front and donate money afterwards. It'll go towards you know, Dr. Reaver and his wife. Mm -hmm. And people were coming up and dropping money in the box, sticking money in his pocket. He had no idea because no one told him about uh, it, right? Yeah. We didn't tell him. And afterwards, he said, Ron, this is really strange. People are putting money in my pocket. <laughs> and, and so we, we got all the money together afterwards, and I went up to his room. And I, there was probably about maybe four or $5,000, you know? Wow. Yeah, just in cash. Yeah. It was just all bills, right? No, no checks, just cash. And, uh, and I take it to him, and he went, I go. This is yours. I said. This is you know. This is this is from us to you. I mean, you you laid the you 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 you're like Nelson okay. Mandela. Yeah. You, you know, you paid the price. You know, yeah. for us. You know, um, and so and he got the reason he was in jail. They got him for they 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 called it practicing medicine without a license. There was no licensure mm -hmm. in the state of Ohio at the time, right? Right. And so when the chiropractor started seeing more patients, the medics would get pissed. And they'd go over to the cops, and then they'd go to the DA, and then they'd, they'd round up the chiropractors. And then they'd either pay a $25 fine, get their picture taken, and get it goes in the newspaper, and then they can go back to leave, and it would slow them down. Yeah. 
or go to jail. Well, they always paid the fine and did right. it. Well, one day he just said, I'm not knuckling under anymore. Those are his words. I'm not knuckling under anymore. Do with me what you will. And they threw him in jail. That was his first stint. And then he had many more after that because he just wouldn't succumb to yeah, them. Yeah. He just wouldn't succumb to them. And that's what, st- you know, I mean, when I saw him, he was still practicing. They had licensure. He was still practicing without a license. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so anyway, so him, he was a big mentor of mine. Fred Barge was a big mentor of mine. Um, uh, Ian Grossom was a big mentor of mine because this guy was just a, a phenomenal chiropractor. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people I can think of, but, you know, those are like the early ones that I can, that kind of molded my, well, yeah. like that. And BJ, because I read BJ. Even I, I was collecting green books when I was in school. When I, what quarter are you in? Uh, eighth quarter. Eighth. So I, collect, I started collecting green books when I was in like fourth quarter. Wow. Right. We would write write letters to every used bookstore in the country. Wow. In the go to the library on a phone book. Yeah. And we'd write, ask if they have any green books. Da da da. And we probably collected about maybe four or five of them. You know. Uh-huh. And uh, and so I was always reading BJ. And you know. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So so BJ Palmer was probably one of my you know. He was in my office. I have I have four rooms, but three of them are in a corner. So there's one here, one there, and one there. I can stand right here and put my my arms in each one over here, uh-huh. and my leg in the other. Right, that's a close air, and there's yeah. no doors on them. So it's kind of like an open close concept because there's walls. Yeah. So you have the privacy with the doors. There's no doors. And when you walk out of this, there's a wall in front of you. You can go right or left, and there's B. J. Palmer on that wall. Sure. Yeah, with the old picture of him like this, mm-hmm. you know. And that's so every time I'm adjusting, when I walk out, if I look that way. Mind you. So I have to. That's why I answer to you know yeah. because it's like he, that's the guy who really started it all. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, beautiful. So many stories. Um, so anything you'd like to close with? I mean, I just want to give you the opportunity to sit. You know, brought in so many amazing stories. You've done so much for chiropractic already, and now uh, we're lucky enough to have you as an interim president to really kind of put your stamp or, or support the the vision of Life Blessed. Um, anything that you'd like to kind of close with to let students know about you? Come see me. Okay. <laughs> you know, someone asked me the other day if I would start something like on a, in the evening, like at the end of the day, like at five o'clock mm-hmm. and do like a philosophy thing or a you know, history thing. So I think we're going to implement that. Okay. That maybe, maybe every Wednesday, I'm, I don't know the day yet, but yeah. maybe every Wednesday yeah. and we'll do it over in the, over in the bistro. And if it, if that gets packed out, we'll go somewhere else. I'd like to do it in the, in the, in the, uh. What's it called? What's outside the bistro? The patio. Oh, the patio. We'll get we'll get a few fire pits out there yeah. and just talk chiropractic, you know. So um, so if we get that going, come, you know, and we'll do some with that. Fireside chats. Fireside chats, <laughs> exactly. It. And and I think the biggest thing I'd like the students to know is just that is that Life West is here for you. Yeah. And it doesn't mean anything you want you're gonna get. You know, like I wanna I want I don't want to go to school for five weeks. You know, it's not like that. Yeah. But we are here to make you the best chiropractor you can possibly be. Sure. And there might be things that don't make sense to you, and that's okay, because there's things that don't make sense to me yeah. to this day. But I still do them, and I realize later I get the lesson. Like listen, like Dr. Sid, couldn't understand it, you know? And then finally clicked, and then I, grew, then I got it. And that's actually better, because when you, it's in your head, yeah. then it's just in your head, but when it gets here, then you own it. You know, you don't own anything up here. This is, that's this is like you know garbage in, garbage out. But this is like you own it. So, so if things don't make sense, if something doesn't seem right, just ask the questions you need. But like you said, just move with it. Find the silver lining. In life, you got to find the silver lining and stuff. Yeah. You know, you can go negative if you want to, and it, what's it going to get you? Your vibration's going to go down. Yeah. And so keep yourself in a, you know, on a high level and really be here. Take advantage of these four years that that you can become the best chiropractor. Ever. I mean, I really mean it. And it's not going out to outside seminars like that. You can learn what you need here, but own the work and learn the philosophy. Because mm-hmm. the basis of when you get out and practice, it's the philosophy that's going to keep you going. Yeah. Sciences are good. Listen, you're going to get cases that walk in, you're going to go, man, that's this. You're going to refer them out or do whatever. Yeah. But whenever you refer them out, you make sure that they got an appointment to come back in. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife, we've referred people out. We're taking an x ray, seeing an aortic aneurysm, it looks like it's going to pop. We tell them, get out, of, with just their neck, get out of here, go right to your medical doctor, take this film with you. And they've come back, you know, saying to my wife or me, you saved my life. You know, I mean, you know, they, we, emergency surgery, da, 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 and then they, then they, they come, come back. back. Yeah, so, so, you know, and that's what your science will do for you. But your philosophy is the why you do what you do. Yeah. And when you go into doubt, if there's ever doubt, because there will be, we all go into doubt, we're human, right? 
the philosophy that's going to bring you out of doubt. You have to remember the philosophy that we do. So that's what I would say to the students, you know, and I and, and I love to meet every single one of them if I could. You yeah. know, trying to meet them, you know, and um, and I want them to know that that uh, that you know we're here for you. You're, the staff is here for you. The administration is here for you. And that's if this is your college and that in that this is your experience. Mm -hmm. You know, but you're going to be gone, you know, and then the next group's going to come in. It's kind of like camp, you know, yeah. and you're going to be gone. And the next group comes in and you're going to be, there we go, and the next group comes in. But the legacy is don't forget the college. Yeah. You know, give back. Because if you don't give back, then you're not, you're not helping chiropractic in the future. And that's really what, you got, you got now covered. I'm, I'm, I'm really good with this generation. You guys are going to take care of it. I'm yeah. more concerned about the next generation yeah. and, you know, of chiropractors. You know, not how they're going to be, but are they going to be? So I want to endow onto you that sacred trust and your group, you know, your, your, your generation, to make sure you give back, give back to the schools and give back to your state organization. And, you know, just don't think, oh, he'll do it, they'll do it, I'm not going to do it. You know, it's really important because that's why chiropractic's where it is. And that's, it can only be where it is based on us. You know, the law SB 150, you know about that? Yeah. You guys did phenomenal. I, mean, I, I, we sent, I sent that email, sent that the message out. Right. It, I just got an email the other day from Kathy Reek. She, she's the um, she's the she's head of the board of New Mexico, mm -hmm. and uh, it got tabled, which is great. That's what we wanted awesome. five to three. So it's it's off the table now. It won't be voted on again. And you know, she said to me, "Thank Ron, you guys went above and beyond." I had I had administrators sending letters. We had you guys uh, emails and calls and you know all that kind of stuff and. And that's what did it. So we've got to work together. It's us, you know. It's, you know, there's, that's no me. It's we. And yeah. and that's really what it's about. So just protect the legacy, so that when my grandkids or my grand my great grandkids are born, I know that they're gonna be able to get adjusted from birth and and have what they need, you know. And that's really that's what I can say to the students. Embrace it, and take it, and come talk to me if you need. And I'm here for you on whatever level. I mean, whatever level. Yeah, yeah. Something we were talking about in club today was uh, make it better than you found it. Yeah. Right, so if you're here at Life West right now, like, what can I do today to make Life West better for the next generation, the exactly. generation behind me? Yeah, and, I, and I'll add one thing to that. What club was that? Uh, Functional neurology. Good, good. Yeah. I like that stuff. You, Dr. Carrot's coming tomorrow. Yeah, I, can't I know. Wait. I know. I'm gonna see him. I'm <laughs> I love him. I can tell you great stories about Ted too, because he's he's this guy. When I became when I was running for vice president of the ICA, uh -huh. right? He called me up and said, Ron, what do you need? We are not letting drugs in chiropractic, because this was a big time when drugs were really pushing uh, okay, chiropractic. Yeah. You know, this was about maybe six years ago, I don't know, five years ago. And, and he, said, he said, I'm with you. Whatever you need, I'm with you. I go, thanks, Ted. You're so, he's, he is, this guy, he's unbelievable. I mean, he's a, unbelievable. He's a great guy. I'll see him tomorrow. We're going to spend some time together. Okay. But, but um, I'm going to add one thing to what you just said. Instead of make it better, make it great. Make it great. Because if you make it great, the next group will make it greater. Yeah. Better is, you know, Great. Yeah. We're striving for greatness, you know? Yeah, we are striving for greatness. <laughs> oh, thanks for your time. Appreciate you very much. Yeah,